Good afternoon, everyone. Librarian Danielle Belanchi here from the Côte St. Luke Public Library. Today, we have another great program for you. The library is thrilled to have the opportunity to host a live conversation with best-selling author Kristen Harmel. Thank you very much, Kristen, for taking the time to speak with me today, as well as to Adria from Simon & Schuster for making this event possible. To begin with, I will share a condensed bio, and then Kristen will join us. Kristen Harmel is the New York Times bestselling, USA Today bestselling, and number one international bestselling author of the Book of Lost Names, The Winemaker's Wife, and a dozen other novels that have been translated into 28 languages and sold all over the world. A former reporter for People magazine, Kristen has been writing professionally since the age of 16. After stints covering health and lifestyle for American Baby, Men's Health, and Women's Day, she became a reporter for People magazine while still in college and spent more than a decade working for the publication, covering everything from the Super Bowl to high-profile murders to celebrity interviews. Her favorite stories at People, however, were The Heroes Among Us, features tales of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. In addition to a long magazine writing career, Kristen was also a frequent contributor to the national television morning show, The Daily Buzz, and has appeared on Good Morning America and numerous local television morning shows. Kristen was born just outside Boston and spent her childhood there, as well as in Columbus and St. Graduating with a degree in journalism with a minor in Spanish from the University of Florida, she spent time living in Paris and Los Angeles and now lives in Orlando with her husband and son. She's also the co-founder and co-host of the weekly web show and podcast, Friends and Fiction. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs> so that was a bit of a mouthful. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but it was very impressive. Okay. So it sounds like, Kristen, you knew what you wanted to do from a very young age. Could you please tell us more about how you were able to get your foot in the door so early? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I did. I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, and uh, except for a very brief period, I always joke, I had this little period in my childhood where I was like, I'm going to be a pop star. Um, and my, my name was going to be Mystica. I had my stage name. All <laughs> out. And I, the only problem was I actually can't sing. I have like zero musical talent. So that was the major thing that stood in my way. So writer it is. Um, but yeah, I, I've always wanted to uh, write novels, um, but it didn't feel like a very realistic career goal from the start. Um, in retrospect, I wish it was something I had maybe taken a chance with a little bit earlier. I think I just didn't believe in myself. But um, I started off as a journalist um, because I thought, you know, that that would incorporate my love of writing. It would incorporate sort of this ability to talk to people and find out their stories, which I think is really at the heart of novel writing anyhow. And so when I was 16, I started pitching local magazines, um, cleverly omitting uh, the fact that I was 16. So, you know, making them <laughs> without actually lying, making them think I was an adult. And so by the time the editor I was working for figured it out, I'd already been writing for him for a few months because I was just doing it remotely and like sending him. It was actually back before um, email was really a thing. It was like in the mid nineties. So I would literally mail him the pieces, <laughs> which is that it was that long ago. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've been writing professionally since I was 16. Um, and as far as getting my foot in the door um, for novel writing, uh, I actually wrote my first novel when I was, I think 23 or 24. Um, and I already had a literary agent um, because I, prior to writing my first novel, um, I had thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to write a nonfiction book? Wouldn't that be the right way to get into things? And don't laugh at me. This is how silly am I? Um, what I actually attempted to do when I was like 22 or 23 was to write a book about how to survive your 20s, which I don't know why I thought I knew anything about that when I was at the very beginning of my 20s. But um, that book didn't sell, but it did get me a literary agent. So by the time I did write my first novel, I was already kind of all set up. And, uh, and that first book um, came out in 2006. 
Okay, so that, that was a very interesting ruse that <laughs> you chose to disguise your age and to <laughs> get your, your foot into your career. So that's great. Um, how do you find, um, was it difficult for you to transition from uh, magazine writing and reporting to novel writing? Um, yes and no. And, and these are great questions. Thank you. Um, yes and no. Um, it was difficult because, uh, by the point I, by the time I started writing novels, the primary magazine I was writing for was People Magazine. And so while I had, uh, worked for other magazines before that encouraged much longer pieces, um, the whole idea of writing for People Magazine was to make things as short as possible. So I went from basically having it drilled into my head every week that everything I wrote had to, you know, encapsulate everything in 200 words um, to suddenly being allowed to write 100,000 words. Like it was just such a completely different form of writing. So I think that was a challenge. Um, But I think some of the things about being a journalist that helped me when it came to novel writing um, were that I think being a journalist for a long time helped me to develop um, an ear for realistic dialogue, which I think is something that a lot of beginning novelists struggle with. But I think because I had been interviewing people, and taking down their words for so many years, um, I was able to write dialogue from the beginning. Um, It also gave me a sense of how to research things, um, which I might not have otherwise had. You know, I think if you um, come from a career as an attorney or or a a journalist or something like that, where research has been part of your job, um, you maybe have a little bit of an easier road into being a novelist. And finally, I think it was helpful... um, to have spent years writing on deadline as a journalist, uh, because it it taught me that writing is a job, not just a um, not just something I do. You know, when when the the mood or the impulse strikes, it was something that you know. If this is the day I say I'm going to deliver my manuscript, it better be in that day. So it helped me with I think schedule setting and, and sticking to schedules. And thank you, Kristen, and congratulations on a beautifully written book. Thank you. A very poignant novel. So I'm referring, of course, here to the book of Lost Names. <laughs> so thank you very much, Adria, at to Simon & Schuster for sending me the book. It's brilliant. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kristen. Um, you can really tell how much you love books in your writing of this book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you first fell in love with books? Yeah. Um, so I have been a reader as long as I can remember. And I think I probably came to to loving books the same way most people do, just um, just because my, my mom read to me all the time. And um, it, I had members of my family, like such as my, uh, my Aunt Donna, um, who was a huge reader, and I really looked up to her. And so like, to me, reading was cool, because Aunt Donna read and Aunt Donna loved reading. Um, so, you know, I, books were always a part of my childhood. I remember my grandmother reading books to me when I was very, very small. Um, and I, because I loved books, um, I was eager to learn to read. And, you know, once I learned to read, um, that just became my world. I mean, I was the kid whose bad behavior was, I would sit under the blankets at night with my flashlight reading the book. Like that was, <laughs> that was misbehaving. You know, I was a really terrible kid. Um, but yeah, I, I've always loved books. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, I've, I've always aspired to be a writer, but it actually wasn't until I read, um, the diary of Anne Frank, when I was probably around 11 or 12, that I really understood how, um, how books could change the world. Um, I I think prior to that, I, I thought that, um, books were for entertainment. You know, I had grown up reading Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and, you know, these books that were, were adventures and, you know, immersions into other entertaining worlds. Um, but I think reading the diary of Anne Frank, uh, opened up my eyes to the idea that you could change people's hearts through stories and through carefully chosen words, if that makes sense. Um, And so while I have always wanted to be a writer, I think it was that book that really solidified that goal because um, I I knew I could hopefully one day do some good with my writing too. Thank you, Kristen. Definitely a popular book at our library as well. (laughs) Um, For those tuning in, I'm just going to share a very brief synopsis of the plot of the Book of Lost Names. Inspired by an astonishing true story from World War II, a young woman with a talent for forgery helps hundreds of Jewish children flee the Nazis in this unforgettable historical novel 
from the international best-selling author of the epic and heart-wrenching World War II tale, The Winemaker's Wife. So Kristen, why was it important for you to tell this particular story? Um, well, you know, my previous two novels, The Winemaker's Wife and The Room on Rue Amelie, were both set in World War II France. Um, hang on one second. My four-year-old's walking into the room. I apologize. Oh, no, I'm really sorry, but I want one of those colorful new candy horns. Not right now, honey bun. I, I'm, I'm, doing my, I'm doing my thing. Remember, I told you, go back out there. I'll be out in about 30 minutes. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, the, you know, the, this is one of the challenges of the, um, of the pandemic is normally he's in school. Um, and if I were to have an event like this during the day, normally we'd have a babysitter over or something, but you know, it's not in school and, um, and we're being really careful. We're not having other people come into our house. So, um, uh, it's real life. That's okay. It's, it's, it's life. I, I apologize, but it's like, I gave him a snack. I set him in front of the TV. <laughs> what, what, what else can I have prepared? Ah, sorry. Um, anyhow, so my, I, I had lived in Paris in my early twenties. So I have a, a great passion for France. Um, I, I have a passion for telling World War II stories set in France. My first historical fiction novel I wrote um, was The Sweetness of Forgetting, which came out in 2012. And that was set partially in France. Um, so I, I have that link to the country because I, I, um, I lived there. Um, my uh, dad's side of the family um, is French, um, uh, partially French, partially um, Eastern European. But so I have that sort of family link to it, that family connection that I feel. Um, but after writing several novels set in World War II France, including The Winemaker's Wife and The Room on Rue Amelie, I realized I was talking about um, people um, using forged documents uh, to escape, to move on, you know, to wherever they needed to go during the war. And it had never really occurred to me, where are these forged documents coming from? I mean, I knew who was handing them to the people, but like, who was making them? And so it kind of started me thinking, um, you know, who, who are these document forgers? How do you get into that? How do you learn how to forge documents? Um, you know, certainly there wasn't a school for it and there wasn't, you know, one central location you'd go to to learn. The, these were things that were sort of just popping up all over Europe uh, to meet this, you know, this deep need. Um, and so it was exploring those questions that led me um, into this book. As, as soon as I began looking into it, I thought, yeah, that's absolutely a novel. But it didn't completely come together in my head until my literary agent sent me um, an article from the New York Times, I think it was January of 2019, about the Nazi looting of books toward the end of World War II. And the fact that there are still millions of books in German libraries that were stolen during World War II. Um, and, you know, I had read about um, art looting. I had read about, you know, the Germans taking other things of value, but I had never realized they'd taken so many books. Um, and that kind of became the perfect story to wrap around the story of the forgeries. And it allowed me kind of, like you said earlier, to talk about um the importance of books and, and how I think books connect us all and, and can mean so much to people. Well, thank you so much for writing this. Uh, I'm sure everyone at home listening in who hasn't read it yet will be putting their name down and <laughs> wants to read it as soon as possible. Uh, your writing style is so effortless and fluid. It's easy to get absorbed right from the start into Eva's world when we first meet her. Yeah. How did her character first come to you? And did you begin with the plot or the characters for this story? That is a really good question. I think generally when I write a novel, um, I begin with the basic idea. So in this case, the basic idea would have been a story about document forgers in France with the story of Nazi looted books wrapped around it. Like that was sort of the central idea. Uh, once I have that central idea, I write out maybe like a two or three paragraph synopsis, just so I kind of have in my head, this is vaguely basically where I'm going. From that synopsis, I think naturally springs a character, if that makes sense. Um, and kind of a very vague idea of the character. Um, because once I, I know what I'm going to be writing about and kind of where I want the story to go, I sort of have a sense of what kind of character needs to be there to get that story to that place, if that makes sense. And it also has to be a character who 
will grow in some dramatic way through the course mm -hmm. of the novel. Because I think that's what makes for interesting reading. You don't want to read some, you don't want to read a book about somebody who starts out completely extraordinary and just continues to do extraordinary things. Like it, I, to me, I think it's more of a journey to go on if you start with someone um, who is just an ordinary person doing ordinary things and then they find themselves in, in these dark, complicated times and um, they rise to the occasion. So it has to be a character who's going to transform. But then once I have the basic idea of the character in my head and the basic idea of the plot in my head, I start doing just as much research as I can. And it's while I'm doing that research that the story and the character develop. And, and it, it, that's almost not even a deliberate thing. It's, and maybe it's just that I've written that, you know, that I've been doing this for so long now that like, now I have a sense of how things to kind of need to go and need to develop. But um, sort of as I'm doing that research and learning about it, there are like little, you know, light bulbs going on everywhere in my head, like, oh, this person should do this. And then this could happen. And oh, I, I love that element about how forgery works. That could play a part in this, you know, this part of the plot. Um, and so sometimes I jot those things down as I come across them. Um, sometimes they just kind of live up here until they develop. Um, but the long answer to your short question is that um, I can't 100% say which comes first, the chicken or the egg, because they're kind of occurring at the same time, if that makes sense. It does, Kristen. <laughs> I loved the character of Eva. Uh, I have to say I had a really difficult time with her mother's character. I knew you were going to say that. Mamos, yeah. <laughs> Very hard time with her. Um, I found her actually infuriating many times throughout the book, and I could not believe uh, how patient Eva was with her, <laughs> continually very patient, um, always trying to console her regardless of her foul mood. Uh, was this intentional on your part to have very different mother-daughter characters? Yes, because so I'm glad you brought that up because you know what? It's it is probably the number one thing um, that I honestly probably the only real complaint I, I get about the book. <laughs> like if, if people, you know, email me and say like, blah, blah, blah. Like if it's something negative, inevitably it's about the mother, um, which I understand. She was a difficult character to write because as a writer, you want you get attached to your characters, especially the ones who are playing a central role and the ones who at their heart are good, right? Like, I, I don't necessarily feel that attached to the people who are going to turn out to not be nice people in the end, but the mom's not a bad person. She just doesn't grow. And um, it was difficult to write a character who didn't grow and who just dug her heels in and stayed in place and kind of therefore became a roadblock for her daughter. Um, and when I say it was difficult to write her, I mean, because... I wanted what was best for her. I wanted her to grow. I wanted her to say, look at this new world I'm living in. How can I best be a part of it? And she just didn't. But that said, I think that's very realistic. And I think it's realistic for World War II, but I also think it's realistic for any tough time we find ourselves in. Um, I think we all want to believe that if, if, you know, things go wrong, we're going to like immediately step up and do absolutely the right thing and grow and change and be a part of the change and all of those things. Um, but I, I don't think that we always do. And, and the things that hold us back aren't, aren't, um, aren't necessarily selfish. I think that in the case of Ava's mother, um, she is paralyzed by fear. Um, she's lost her husband. Um, uh, her, you know, her husband very early in the, in the book um, is arrested and taken away um, as part of the Valdiv roundups in the summer of 1942 in France. Um, so all she has left is her daughter. And she's, um, she is uh, uh, sort of adrift in this world. The daughter's the only thing anchoring her in place. And now the daughter's saying, I want to change. I want to be part of helping people. And instead of saying, you know, good for my daughter, let's make a better world together. She's like, no, I don't want to lose you too, which I think is a really typical reaction. And the more Ava moves into helping people at the, at the peril of her own life, the more the mother pulls her or tries to pull her in the other direction. Um, it, and it's, it's truly out of fear. And, um, you know, the mother worries a lot about being erased. That's kind of a theme that runs through this book. Um, 
Ava worries whether she's erasing the identities of these children who she's making new documents for, for example. The mother worries that by changing, um, and, and, you know, for instance, by, um, you know, Ava is Jewish and she's working in the back of a church, um, posing as a Catholic girl so that she doesn't look suspicious. Um, and the mother worries that that means she's erasing where she came from, um, and, and so that's kind of a thread that runs throughout, too. Um, the mother worries that Ava is erasing her culture and her future and herself, um, but that also, also that France and Germany are conspiring to erase um, all the Jews of, of France, which, I mean, really, they were, um, which, you know, was horrible. That, that's kind of at the center of this. So uh, anyhow, long story short, a, a, lot of, a lot of the push and pull between Ava and her mother has to do with the mother loving her deeply, but being terrified about what's happening. Thank you. I, I don't want to give away too much with what happens with the mother because some people are still waiting for the book and want to read it. Um, you spoke about Judaism and Christianity, which are important themes uh, in the novel. And uh, the priest, I thought, had a really nice way of speaking to Eva when she wasn't sure if she should listen to her heart or her mother. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and it's interesting. One of the reasons I decided to write the character of the priest is that um, a lot of the resistance networks, particularly those that dealt with children, um, were affiliated with churches, um, not just Catholic churches, but other uh, Protestant denominations, too. Um, and I think that maybe part of that came from... Um, the idea of um, us all being children of God, um, you, you know, and, and us all having a responsibility to protect um, our, our fellow man, um, you know, despite what, you know, despite differences in, in beliefs. Um, and so that's kind of something that Ava struggles with, too, because the mother is accusing her of, um, you know, I I ignoring who she is and ignoring her religion and, and, you know, throwing that away to become something else. And she's not, but because her mother is saying that to her, she's wondering if it's true. And, and so I think she does, you know, you know, because I think when someone you love says something like that to you, you can't help but think, am I, am I really doing that? You know, am I, am I misleading myself? And so I think that, um, she comes to trust the priest um, and she comes to believe um, that, that there's maybe more than one right way to listen to God, if that makes sense. And I don't mean at all that she's discarding, you know, anything about her faith or where she came from. Um, but, but just that he, they, they both love God in, in the same way. And I think that he's able to kind of illuminate, that for her and, and that it's not a betrayal. You know what I mean? It's, it's, but th that is something she struggles with. Um, and, you know, I feel like it's a question that I kind of keep coming back to in my writing that kind of the, the differences between religions and kind of how they worked together, particularly during world war II. And um, some of that links back to the sweetness of forgetting the, the 2012 novel novel I wrote that I mentioned. Um, one of the central plot points of that novel was one of the most fascinating things I've ever read about World War II. I was so thrilled to be able to put it in a book. And that was how in, um, in Paris during World War II, the Grand Mosque of Paris, which was the Muslim center of Paris, um, in, in cooperation with Jewish groups and Christian groups, helped save over a thousand Jews in Paris, which I think is fascinating to think of Muslims, Jews, and Christians working together um, for the good of mankind. I mean, just because it, the, the religious differences didn't matter. What mattered was that they were all human and they were fighting against something that was wrong. Um, and I think um, I, I told that story a little bit in The Sweetness of Forgetting, um, but it's a story that, I mean, that a decade ago just kind of landed here and it's never really gone away. So I think I kind of keep in, in various ways coming back to that well. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a dynamic of World War II that really fascinates me. Thank you, Kristen. Another interesting character, it's not a person, uh, but is, I believe, uh, the city of Orignon. Have you yourself visited that city? And how did you go about um, depicting it in such a... Um, a way where we could kind of imagine the colors and the feeling of the town. 
Well, that was such a great compliment because I, um, I feel like one of the weaknesses I have as a writer is, um, writing setting. That's something I really struggle with. Um, and so, you know, how I was saying earlier as a journalist, the dialogue is relatively comes relatively easily to me setting doesn't. And I, and I wonder if that's because I started off as a journalist and in journalism, if you're writing, you know, unless you're writing a very long feature piece, you typically don't deal as much with setting. So it was kind of something I didn't pay a lot of attention to for many years. Um, and it's a side of my novel writing I'm continually trying to get better at. Um, and actually, as a side note, my next novel that'll be out next July um, is like so much more setting than I've ever dealt with before. And I almost wonder if I did that on purpose. Cause I'm like, okay, this is like the time that that part of me needs to grow. Right. Um, but, but so, um, Orignon is actually fictional. Um, it is a kind of combination of, um, some French towns I've been to. Um, but also, um, there's an area of France, um, called the the plateau sort of referred to as the plateau and it was a very active area of resistance and a very active area of document forgery because it was a very non-strategic area in terms of the military there wasn't really going anything or anything much going on there it wasn't there were no main roads through there there were no you know train lines that went anywhere important it was just a, basically a place that was sort of off the beaten path um, and it was a place that um, had a lot of summer vacation homes. People would come down from Paris and other larger cities and spend time there in the summer. Um, but during the war, it, it wasn't serving that purpose. People weren't going on, you know, these nice family vacations during World War II, um, nor was it typically used much in the winter. So anyhow, that became a very common place um, to stash children who were being moved other places. Um, but ultimately, I couldn't find out enough about that area of France um, that I felt comfortable. I, I didn't feel comfortable enough setting a story in a place I didn't feel completely comfortable in. So I took elements of that, elements of other places I knew, and kind of wove them together in a place that I felt um, sort of served the story. And also in, um, in the area of the plateau, there was a very, um, a very, active um, Christian group that was very responsible for the resistance activities going on there. And uh, in particular, the moving of the children and the document forgeries. Mm -hmm. And I also felt like if I set the real story there, I would almost be doing an injustice to the real life people who had worked on that real life escape line um, by, by so heavily fictionalizing them. Um, so it was better for me from a storytelling perspective to draw inspiration from that, but to create um, the characters myself. It, it let me, um, I think, give a richer life to the people in that town, if that makes sense. Perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you touched on it just a little bit right now. Um, can you explain maybe to our audience? Um, so it does say in the jacket that this is based on true events. Can you tell us a little bit about which elements are based on fact, which characters in the book? I, I can, but my four-year-old's coming in again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Honey, what do you need? You just, oh, okay. He's just coming in to keep me company. Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to come say hi quickly? You want to come over? Okay. Are you almost done? I'm almost done, but let's, let's say hi real quick. This is, this is Hi. Noah. <laughs> nice to meet you, Noah. Okay. You got to let me finish up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the elements that are true, um, as I mentioned, the escape lines um, were, were very real and were a very important part of saving um, many children in France who probably would not have otherwise survived. Um, and, and gosh, I mean, I, I just think sometimes what a what a wrenching thing, what a wrenching decision that would have been, a, an impossible decision, to be a, a parent somewhere in France, knowing that the only chance your child had to survive would be to send them away. I mean, what what a what a horrible decision to have to make. Um, but the elements of forgery in the book, the actual. Um, the, the way the documents were forged um, were based very heavily on the stories of um, two very prolific forgers. One was a man named Oscar 
Rizowski, who, um, like Ava, was um, uh, in the unoccupied zone. And um, like Ava, he, he actually worked in the plateau, the area that I was talking about earlier. The other one was named Adolfo Kaminsky. He was in Paris and um, he helped save, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. It was more than 10,000 um, lives through his forgeries. He was a very, very, very prolific forger and a prolific part of the resistance network in Paris because he wasn't just doing forgeries. He was also, for example, going door to door um, to Jewish families and telling them, you need to get out. Tell me what to do. Like, I'm going to forge your documents right now. So he was he was not just in a lab forging things. He was a very active member too, kind of like Ava um, it becomes in a way. Um, so a lot of the methods of forgery were based on their methods of forgery. Um, and uh, additionally, they were both um, young Jewish people who found their way into the resistance in a very similar way um, to, to how Ava found her way into the resistance. Um, they both were forging documents for themselves and family members. Um, people uh, realized they had forged the documents and said, these are awfully good. Could you help us out with some forgeries? Um, so kind of those elements of the story were based on truth. Um, but the actual book of lost names, the book where they recorded um, the, you know, the book that is that the book is named after um, where they use a code to encode the names of children whose names they've changed. Um, that part is actually fictional. Um, but I did use uh, a real 1732 religious text. So this is a, um, this is a French religious text from 1732. Um, and uh, this was basically the model for the book of lost names. And I think that it's kind of interesting because the cover designer um, never saw this book and it's basically the exact same thing. It's, it, you know, the gilding has obviously worn off the cover, but um, it's essentially the exact same book. And I know um, in Canada, I think the spine is, um, it, it looks, uh, it, it j just matches, but in, in, in the United States, this is the spine and it looks yet different, but it, it looks a lot like the spine of the book, which I think is really cool because she never saw this. It was just kind of a coincidence. But as I was doing the, um, the code, uh, which is based on a mathematical sequence called the Fibonacci sequence, I was doing it in the real pages of this book. So I wasn't actually writing in the book, but I would say, you know, on page 163, she put a, um, like a star over the Q and a dot over the A. And it was actually, you know, I was doing it from this book to kind of keep it authentic. So um, this, uh, while I was writing, um, kind of became my little portal to the past, if that makes sense. I would just put my hand on it every day and kind of remember, you know, that that long ago in 1732, somebody was using this book in a Catholic church in France, which kind of is an extraordinary thought. That's great that you actually have the book yeah. and that the book does look like the one on funny? the cover. <laughs> I also uh, really enjoyed uh, the Fibonacci code uh, that you used because it was an interesting way uh, for Eva and Remy to write each other messages in okay. the book of lost names, as well as keep track of uh, the real names of the Jewish children. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about the epic love story that is central to the book? Sure. So, um, so Ava and Remy, um, have a, uh, I don't know how to put it. Um, he's, he's the wrong choice for her for a lot of reasons on the surface. Um, but I think that, uh, we're drawn to each other based on what's at our core as human beings. Um, and, when you're working in dangerous times as they were during World War II, I think the um, the pace of that is accelerated. The the way we're drawn to each other is accelerated. You know, when you um, when, when you don't know if you're going to live to see the next day, um, and and when you're both doing something so um, kind of grand and heroic together, I think that just heightens everything. Um, but at their core, I think from the moment they meet, there's a, there's a connection there. And there's a, there's a seeing of, um, of like-mindedness and like-heartedness. I know that's not a word, but, um, you, you know, I, I, I think they, they, um, there's something very special there between them, but, um, there are, as you know, from having read the book, um, a lot of obstacles standing in their way, um, 
some of which are seemingly simple. So for instance, um, Ava's mother is very against that relationship because um, Remy is Catholic and she wants Ava to be with somebody Jewish, um, which is certainly understandable from the mother's perspective in 1942 when she feels that her entire uh, their entire existence is being erased. I, I mean, I can I can understand where the mother's coming from, but that becomes a challenge for Ava because she has to ask herself whether she's feeling the same way about that relationship that her mother does and whether she's wrong to want something different um, and, and whether she in fact is betraying um, her faith if, if, if she goes against that. So there are a lot of complications like that. And then there are, you know, some life and death complications too. And, you know, life and death always heightens the romance. So <laughs> there were a lot of dramatic um, events unfolding, especially uh, maybe three quarters of the way through the book. Um, can you tell us a little bit, um, maybe not about which character uh, betrays other characters, but a little bit how you were able to include all these elements in succession towards the end? I'm not sure what I can say without giving too much away, but I, I will say that, um, you know, I, I outline my novels before I write and I outline very um uh, very thoroughly. Um, that's just the way I've always done things. I write very long outlines. My outlines are probably about 20,000 words. Um, and, and a finished novel, or at least one of my finished novels is about a hundred thousand words. So I'm, it's almost like a, just very abbreviated short draft. Um, so typically when I sit down to write a novel, I know all the beats, I know how it's going to begin, how it's going to end and sort of the main things that are going to happen. Um, this was the first time in a while um, that I was surprised by um, who who became the betrayer. Um, I had somebody different in mind until I got to about the midpoint of the book. And then I was like, oh, it could only be this person. <laughs> so, um, so I surprised myself with that, I would say, um, which was interesting. That doesn't happen to me very often. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that. But yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll also say, you know, just kind of like I said with the the mother, um, not everybody in the middle of a war reacts the way we would want them to react. And sometimes, sometimes dark times, you know what, I think dark times push us more into who we already were in some cases. Um, and maybe that's kind of what happens here. I hope that answered it enough. I was like, I don't know how to answer that without giving. It too much away. <laughs> yes, oh, that was that was very good, very good, Kristen. <laughs> um, okay, so what else would I like to talk to you about? I would like to talk to you without. Again, it's difficult not to give away too much, but there is uh, there are a few scenes in a library in Paris that are very important. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you included? Uh, this location? Is it one of your uh, favorite places in Paris? Um, it, it is a place I like in Paris. Um, but you know, the library I had in the book, I, funny, nobody has asked me that. And like, I was just saying to you earlier, I think I've done like 80 of these Zooms since July. No one has specifically asked about that library. So I'm glad you asked. Um, the novel, when I turned in the first draft of the novel, um, it actually began and ended with a fairy tale. I had a fairy tale prologue and a fairy tale um, uh, epilogue. And I don't mean like really a fairy tale, but it was kind of like, um, it was like once, I mean, it didn't actually literally say once upon a time, but it was essentially like once upon a time, there was a girl in Paris and she was, she was a princess. It was, you know, it was basically telling this story of how um, long ago, um, Ava would sit on the steps of this library. And I think there's a little element of it actually that did make it into the book where, where she and Remy talk about this, but it was very much spelled out in the first draft. Um, she would sit on the steps of this library while her father was inside working and she would imagine that she was a princess. Um, 
and that that a white knight was going to ride up and save her. And, you know, it was, you know, like like little girls dream of fairy tales and that um, that one day um, while she's sitting on the steps, she sees a little boy and um, he understands immediately that she's dreaming of being a princess. Like she says something ridiculous to him. That's, you know, part of her little like princess fantasy. And they're just little. Um, And then he immediately gets it and says something to her that completely, you know, he's being he's already being the knight in her fairy tales. So um, I loved the prologue and the epilogue. And I chose a place in Paris that I felt looked like um, something that could be out of a little girl's fairy tale, something royal, something grand, something that that would be very memorable for her. Um, So um, without that prologue and that epilogue, the library has a little bit less meaning. Um, But but that was it from the beginning. I I had this idea that long, long ago, before they knew each other, um, you know, before they met years later, Ava and Remy had actually met on the steps of this library. Um, And so it became this place where perhaps their story should end too. So I, I won't, I won't say more than that, but that was actually the genesis of the library idea. <laughs> so the library is a theme. Um, there's this library in Paris. There's also a library in Berlin. Um, I will say, I don't think it's giving too much away that the book at some point is lost from Eva. Yep. Um, and it, it is retrieved later yes. on. Um is this based on an a- actual facts? Yeah, it, it, to some extent. So, um, so the library where I set the book in in Berlin, or portions of the book in Berlin, um, is is a real library, and it is a library um, that has a collection of I think three and a half million books. And of those three and a half million books, approximately a third, so over a million books, um, were stolen, were were books that were stolen during World War II. So to this day, in 2020, a third of this library's collection consists of books that were taken from other people during World War II. Um, There are librarians and provenance researchers there who have made it their life's work to return as many of those books as they can. Um, But as you can imagine, you know, we're 75 years past the war. And the people those books belong to, for the most part, aren't here anymore. Um, So one thing that is going for them is that um, the uh, Germans, as they were taking things, were quite good at keeping records. So there do exist a lot of records about where the books came from. Um, The problem is a lot of them were taken from Jewish families, and then those Jewish families were taken away and and completely wiped out, Um, which is a really haunting thought to think of these books still existing but the people who loved them aren't here anymore and and didn't never had the chance to have children and grandchildren who could have received those books back so that thought really haunts me um but the the researcher um or or the librarian there who ultimately um who who finds uh the book of lost names um and has it in this German library um, in, in 2005 is based very loosely on a real researcher um, and real librarian at, um, at at that library in Berlin. So yes, that, that part is real and that work is ongoing. Um, there's also a project based in um, Harvard, uh, Harvard University in the United States um, in uh, Massachusetts uh, that also is led by a professor there to be returning some of these books. So um, it's fascinating to me, but I I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about what, what books mean and the importance of books. And can you imagine receiving a book that it belonged to your grandmother or grandfather 75 years ago um, or or your great grandparents um, or some member of your family who didn't survive the war, but to receive a book 75 years later that they had actually had their hands on, that they had read, that had meant something to them. um, I feel like that would just mean everything. It's, it's um, writing this book really was a reminder to me that, that books are more than just, the words printed on their pages. Um, Mm -hmm. Books carry stories that have nothing to do with the stories inside of them, if if that makes sense. Um, And and I bet all of us who are, you know, everyone out there who's listening today, if you're listening today, I know you love libraries and I know you love books, um, which means that there has probably been at least one book that has changed your life in a profound way. And that means that that book is part of your story. So I, I don't know, I was just really interested in that idea. 
It's a wonderful idea, Kristen, and it's very sad, as you say, to to realize that certain people will never get to hold those books. But on the other hand, it's great that there are people uh, still uh, working on trying to get those books to the family. I, I just have to share that my son just brought me a candy cane and a cup of water in case I was thirsty or hungry. So, <laughs> thank you, honey. I appreciate that. No, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen, uh, I, I'm going to move it away from this book just for a moment because you said that uh, setting what's all over your next book. Can you just give us a, a little preview of this next book you're working yeah, on? Yeah, sure, sure. So it's called The Forest of Vanishing Stars. It's going to be out July 6th. Um, and my revision is actually due back in two weeks. So um, I am still deep in the forest of vanishing stars right now. Um, but it is, um, it's also set in World War II, but not in World War II France. This is the first time in a while I have departed from World War II France. And it is actually set in World War II Poland. Um, it was Poland during the war. It's um, actually Belarus now, the, the part of Poland that it was in at the time. Um, and it is based on the real life stories of um, of of uh, Jewish refugees who fled into the forests and survived the Nazi onslaught that way. Um, so um, ha- have you, have you ever heard of the, uh, the Bielski brothers? It's um, uh, there's a movie, I think it came out at the end of 2008, the beginning of 2009 called defiance. Um, it stars Daniel yes. Craig. It's a fantastic movie. It's based on a nonfiction book of the same name, uh, defiance. Um, and it's about these brothers with the last name Bielski, um, who were, um, Jewish brothers living right in the edge of a forest. Um, their parents were taken away and murdered. Um, they had other siblings taken away and murdered and four of them escaped into the woods. Um, it started with just 20 or 30 people. Um, And by about a year later, they had 1,200 people living in the woods with them. They set up an entire society there um, with, um, I mean, mean, there was medical care. There were cobblers. There were, you know, all the things you would need in a forest. There were people guarding them. There were people who would go on food missions. Um, They were ready to pack up and leave if the Germans were coming. Like it was, it's, it's incredible. Um, because in Poland, um, there were more Jews murdered than anywhere else. Um, and, and to think that these 1,200 Jews in that group, and then there were other smaller groups similar to that that fled into the forest and survived. So this book is not about the Bielski group or one of the other groups, but it's based on their methods of survival. Um, and I actually got to interview the youngest Bielski brother, <laughs> Noah saying hi again, uh, which was extraordinary. He's 93. He actually lives in Florida now. Um, And he was um, a teenager during the war when when he and his brothers basically led this group into the woods. Um, And that, I will tell you, was one of the most inspiring, impactful interviews I've ever had um, for for a book I was researching. Um, Just to think that um, someone who had been part of something so heroic and and so inspirational, um, you know, was still here to kind of share his story. Um, And he said something really profound to me during that interview. He said, um, Hardship teaches us life. Sorrow teaches us life. And I thought, you know, what a what a perfect um, a perfect message for 2020. Also, this has been a tough year for a lot of us, but it, but it teaches you how to live. The it's the it's the hard times that teach us how to live and how to go on, right? But um, in the Forest of Vanishing Stars, the main character um, is uh, a German girl who is kidnapped by this sort of crazy woman um, when she's two years old from her from her German her wealthy German parents. Um, and she's raised, hang on a second, please. Hang on. She's raised in, okay. I mean, not after the weird thing is going, because I can turn it off. Oh, your TV? Okay, just give me um, a a few more minutes, okay? I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, so, so she's raised in complete isolation in the middle of the woods. And then the woman dies in 1942. And, um, a couple months later, she encounters a group of fleeing Jewish refugees. And it's her first exposure to what's happening in the outside world. Um, and her first exposure really, um, to what it's like to be with other people. Um, so it's kind of a coming of age story. I pitched it as, um, 
where the crawdad sing meets defiance um it meets um rapunzel of all things <laughs> <laughs> you're very very good at marketing <laughs> <laughs> which sounds kind of wacky but it kind of works and um uh, when, wacky, when it, like, like, wacky like 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 wacky racers yeah but um, i think you mean to okay carry. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah. So when I talked about setting though, um, writing a book set in the middle of a forest where the forest is basically, um, a character in and of itself was, was a big challenge to set myself up for. Cause like I said, I, I don't feel like I do setting that well. Um, so this one was really fascinating because the forest had to kind of take on a life of its own. Um, and I also had to have a real handle on, for example, which mushrooms grew in which part of the forest and, and what, and you know, what people would have eaten, um, uh, in, in the middle of January in this part of the forest and, and things like that. What, what kind of oak trees would have grown here? What kind of flora and fauna would you have found in August? I mean, they, you know, there were just so many things that I didn't think about when I set out to write the book, but, um, it was a real, uh, a real learning experience for me. And now I know how to ice fish in the middle of a Polish winter. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it sounds like you have another fantastic novel coming. Thank you. I was, it brings me to a question I, I was thinking of just before uh, Noah's second visit, which is, um, did you have any help for the Polish uh, expressions that appear um, a couple of times in the book and for your next book, of course? Yes. Um, so I've hired, I hire a, um, a translator, um, each for each language I use, um, which has become kind of my norm because a lot of the, a lot of my books, including the book of lost names include multiple languages. So it's not just, sorry, it's, um, it's not just French in this, in, in the book of lost names. Um, it's uh, Polish there's, um, there's German and there's Russian in there too. So I had to hire a translator to make sure that each of the, um, each of the phrases was grammatically correct. Um, and that wasn't just, so, Honestly, I start if I don't know a language, like, so for example, I don't know Polish. Um, I start with whatever Google Translate gives me um, and I plug that in, but that's never what I end up with. I mean, because obviously the translation is, is never correct, but in sharing that translation plus what I intended with, for example, a Polish translator, um, I'm able to come up with like, hopefully what is, what is the right thing? <laughs> And, and actually, it's interesting because I've, I have used those same translators um, for the audiobook because when the audiobook narrator, and I'm so happy that they do this rather than just taking a guess, um, the producer, before they actually start recording the narration, the producer of the audiobook version um, always contacts me and says, these are the words that we're not sure about the pronunciation for. Um, do you have any guidance or do you want us to look into it? And I just, hi- I hire those exact same translators and have them read the sentences um, um, as a, a digital audio file so that the um, the audiobook narrator has it exactly correct from an actual, you know, uh, someone who speaks Polish as a first language or someone who speaks German as a first language or, or whatever. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, definitely you have the right idea there. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention French because we speak English and of French here. So it, just, know, it, it didn't even occur to me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, my last question before I turn it over to uh, audience members, because they may have questions for you as well, is uh, when reading this fantastic story, um, I was visual, visualizing the story in all its grandeur. Um, any talk about film rights here? Yeah, so um, uh, there's nothing to announce yet, but um, there has been some interest, so we'll see. Um, I... I uh, I, my feeling on film rights is that I, Noah, please get off there. Um, my feeling on film rights is, is that nothing is, um, is uh, a sure thing until the cameras start rolling, um, which was a lesson I learned very early on. My, my very first novel, which came out in 2006, was optioned actually the year before it came out in, in 2005. Um, so it was my very, very first experience in publishing, um, obviously. So therefore my first film option. And it was optioned by somebody big. It was optioned by Lawrence Bender, who was Quentin Tarantino's producing partner at that point. Um, They had Hilary Duff attached to star. They had hired screenwriters. Like I thought we were fairly far down the road and I flew out to California and met with them and it seemed like it was all happening. And I didn't have the perspective on the industry yet to know that that can happen and then nothing comes of it. So I was completely crushed when it 
fell apart, which happens like 99% of the time. And it has nothing to do. And one of the reasons for that um, was my book was a, um, like a romantic comedy um, about a woman who falls in love with, um, or who, who has like a disastrous romance and the whole world thinks she's having an affair with this movie star and she's really not, but it's her life spins out of control. That was the first book. Um, but when a date with Tad Hamilton came out, which was a movie back in the mid two thousands um, and didn't do very well at the box office. So that completely eliminated any chances of a movie being made for mine because it was a similar genre. Oh, sort of. We're sorry to hear that, but, but it, you know, it happens. And like, I, I had to learn that hard lesson then. So now when there's a film option um, and I've, you know, a lot of my books have been optioned, but I just look at it as like, what a cool opportunity to go out to California to talk to somebody about my books and to imagine it happening. And one of these days, one of these days, something will happen with it. <laughs> We're all rooting for you. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to ask now if the audience has any questions, please do type them in to the Q&A or the chat and I will read them out to Kristen. In the meantime, while I wait to see if anything pops up, um, can you tell us a bit about your podcast and how this dynamic is working with other authors? Oh my gosh, it has, it, hands down the best thing that's come out of the pandemic for me. It's um. So it's called Friends and Fiction. We are live every Wednesday night on Facebook. Um, and if you're interested in joining us, so today's a Wednesday. So um, we have I, our guest tonight uh, is Robin Carr, who wrote the Virgin River series, which has just been turned into a series um, for Netflix, which is kind of cool. Um, next week, we have the actress Andy McDowell, which is going to be yeah. exciting. I mean, we just have a, a lot of really interesting guests. Um we started it in, um, oh, so if you're interested in joining, just just search for Friends and Fiction on um, on Facebook and it pops right up. Um, we started it in April. It was me, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, Mary Kay Andrews, and Mary Alice Monroe. I I'm not sure how familiar you are with those four authors up in Canada, but they're pretty popular. Um, they're pretty popular here. They're all Southern U.S. writers um, and friends of mine. We started this in April. It just kind of came out of a... Um, a Zoom, a casual Zoom call we did where we we all had book releases um, or, that were coming out, or books that were coming out toward the beginning of the pandemic. We all had canceled book tours and we were all concerned about what was going to happen to the independent booksellers who we were now not going to be supporting, you know, because we, we weren't physically at their stores. Um, we were really worried about what was happening to them. So we got, over, we got together over Zoom just to have a glass of wine and talk about it and kind of, you know, air our frustration and think like, is there anything we can do that's constructive? And we thought, oh, we should do this on Facebook and see if anyone comes and joins us and we can talk about how important it is to support independent bookstores. So we, we did our first show April 15th. We thought maybe we'd have a couple hundred people who saw the video ever. Um, the first one was more successful than we thought. And we said, oh, good, we'll go through May 27th because obviously life will be normal by May 27th again. Um, it, spoiler alert, life was not normal by May 27th. Um, I, but it has turned into a thing. We have almost 25,000 members in our Facebook group now. Um, every week we choose a different independent bookseller to highlight. Um, so I feel like we've done some good with it. Um, we have, like I said, awesome guests. Um, and, and we just talk about books. We talk about the stories behind books. We talk about loving books. We talk about debut authors. We talk about, you know, anything related to the book world. So if you're a reader, um, if you're a writer, cause we give a writing tip every episode, um, it, it's just, it's a nice place to be. And, um, and uh, yeah, the, the Facebook group's really active. People post um, book recommendations all the time um, within the Facebook group. They talk about books. Um, it's just a very active community. So yep, Friends in Fiction every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. This sounds great, Kristen. Um, because some people may not be able to show up at 7, can you give us a sneak peek of the writing tip of the day? You know, um, I, it is, I never know what it is ahead of time because we actually, whenever we have a guest, um, we ask them for a writing tip. So tonight, for example, Robin Carr will be giving her writing tip. We had, um, I will tell you though, we had Sue Monk Kidd last week who was fascinating. I mean, she's just an incredible writer. Um, and she was telling us about her latest book, The Book of Longings, which has been a you know very popular book this year. And um, her writing tip uh, was really interesting. Um, she said that when she's sitting down to write a book, she does um, basically a vision board for the book. So um, she cuts out images that uh, that will 
that in her head tie into the book in some way. And she just pastes them on a board with no real idea of where they're going to fall in the book or how they're going to connect to the book. But they're images that are kind of seared into her mind that she knows are going to connect in some way. And she uses those images to shape a story. Um, I've never heard a tip like that before. Um, So you just kind of never know what you're going to get from the guests. It's one of my favorite things about every episode to hear what, um, you know, these other extraordinary writers that we have on our show have to share with us. It's, it's, it's been very educational for me too. Very interesting. Now I see something popped up in my chat. Holocaust. My grandmother fled Poland as a refugee. Her mother ran a library there and perished at Auschwitz. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. And yes, we're, we're very sorry. Anyone you'd suggest I contact to see what became of the library? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, yep, there's the, uh, gosh, the librarian. You know what I would do? I would I would go to the New York Times site and look up um, uh, Nazi looted books. I bet you you can find that article that I mentioned earlier that my um, that my literary agent shared with me. I believe it was from January of 2019. Um, I believe the librarian at the Central Library in Berlin is named Sebastian Finsterwalder. Um, He would probably be a great place to start. Um, The name of the librarian in um, at at Harvard is actually escaping me, but I wonder if I wrote it in the back of my book. (laughs) I'm just looking right now. Um, Usually I do fairly thorough author notes in the back of the book and I might have actually, yeah, there's, um, I do. I have the names. Um, Sebastian Finsterwalder and Patricia Kennedy Grimstead. Um, she's a, with the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard. And there's also a great book called The Book Thieves, The Nazi Looting of Europe's Libraries and the Race to Return a Literary Inheritance, written by Anders Rydell. So um, if you didn't have a chance to write that down, um, you can check out the Book of Lost Names from the library. And um, and it's actually in the author's note in the back. So though, I would say those would be wonderful people to start with. They could at least point you in the right direction. That's incredible. Wow, what a story. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you from the audience member as well. Uh, one question I didn't get to ask you uh, is th- there is sort of alluding to this in your novel. It's um, how does the next generation deal with a trauma from their parents or from their grandparents? Can you speak a little bit about this? Yeah, it's something that really fascinates me. Um, And I first explored that in The Sweetness of Forgetting in 2012. Um, And, and, you know, when I sat down to write that book, I thought, okay, I'm writing one book that connects to World War II. It's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, And, uh, and, you know, that's that. But I, that was one of the things that really hooked me on continuing to write about this, because I think that for Holocaust survivors, as well as for all of us, the traumas of the past and the experiences of the past shape the present. Um, And I think that one of the, that was really driven home to me prior, you know, long before I started writing World War II books. Um, When I was writing for People Magazine, I, uh, one of the people I got to interview was this fascinating man named Henry Landworth. Um, he had founded an organization called Give Kids the World, which is um, an organization here in Florida um, that uh, provides dream vacations to um, uh, terminally ill or uh, critically ill children and their families. So um, basically like they work with make a wish. So if a ch- uh, make a wish child's wish is to go to Disney world, um, they, they go through give kids the world and they stay at this village and whatever. So Henry Landworth, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, was the founder of give kids the world. And the people story was about give kids the world, but it turned out he had this extraordinary story he was an Auschwitz survivor. Um, he had been in concentration camps from the age of 13 to the age of 18. Um, so basically all of the formative years of his childhood, the most formative years, both of his parents had died. He and his sister survived uh, miraculously. Um, and, you know, he, he told me a lot of his story. He was such a fascinating man. His um, his best friends were John Glenn and Walter Cronkite. Um, I mean, he was just the epitome of an American success story. He came to the United States with literally $20 on him um, and, and became a self-made millionaire. I mean, just an incredible guy. Um, but for all the things he accomplished in his life, um, he there was always something holding him back. 
And that was what stuck with me after our interview. He said, it was this one small thing he said. He said um, that in order to survive the concentration camps, I had to learn to turn my emotions off. And when the war was over, I never knew how to turn them back on again. Um, And that was so profound to me. Um, That idea that, I mean, don't we all just take for granted that we can feel happy and feel sad and feel just these basic human emotions? He never had that from the time he went to a concentration camp to, to survive. He had to figure out how to turn that off and then it, he could never turn it back on. Um, but in thinking about that and reflecting on that over the years um, and then reflecting on kind of the course his life took, think about how that impacted not just him, but his children and his grandchildren. Because if you, if you don't know how to feel, if, if you don't have those feelings, um, your, your children are inevitably impacted by that. And if they're raised by somebody who has, who, who struggles with that, maybe they'll raise their children in a way that struggles with that too. You know what I mean? So it, it's those, you, you think it's just something that, that impacts that first person, but it's absolutely not. It trickles down. And so I'm fascinated by that. And especially by the idea that you're impacted by the things you don't even know. So you might, your grandparent might never have told you about something traumatic that happened to them. Um, and you know, whether it's world war two related or not, but like, but still that becomes a piece of who you are. And I, I, that idea just interests me. And it's, um, it's an idea I kind of keep coming back to, but I don't think I explore it in this next book. (laughs) So I, I, I stepped away from France and I finally stepped away from the psychological impact of generations. I'm almost done, honey. Sorry, but I need help. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I have something else coming in the chat. Um, just a moment. Um, so they're thanking us for this great event and oh, congratulating you, so you on your success. Oh, thank you. This um, is yeah, thank you for having me. This is <laughs> this person says, I love your books and thoroughly enjoyed uh, this hour and looking forward to reading your new books. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have something else. Uh, have you seen the film The Counterfeiters? I have not read your book. This is a panelist. Uh, yet, but looking forward to it. There's a long list, a long wait list. Uh, your future book sounds exciting. The Bielski Brothers was an incredible story about resilience. Your perspective sounds very interesting. Thank you for your gift of writing. Oh, thanks for the kind words. And no, I have not seen that movie. I'll have to add it to my list in 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 all my in all my spare time. <laughs> I'm like, when, when? I've, got, I've got so many things to do, <laughs> but it sounds wonderful. I'll add it. <laughs> I ha- and there is one more thing. It says uh, many people write that intergenerational transmission of trauma is actually in the DNA. Yeah. It's understandable that it passes along by nurture, yeah. but in the DNA. Yeah, that's it's a fascinating thought. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kristen. I think our, our audience is a little bit shy because no one dared to write into the Q and A function. It was such a nice. It was nice to see everyone here, though. I, I saw a, a nice, a nice big group, which was wonderful. And I'm sorry for Noah's interruptions. I, I apologize. <laughs> It's no trouble. It's life. We were very happy to have you. Thank you so much again, Kristen. And do not forget to read her book, oh, yeah. The Book of Lost Names, <laughs> at our library or at Kristen's if you're in the United States. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So and thank you to Simon and & Schuster and Adria for making this possible. And we wish you all of the success in the world with your next book. And we hope to see one of these turned into a movie also. Oh, I would love that. And hopefully, you know, hopefully in the future I can visit in person. So we can. We would love to have you that. anytime once okay. this pandemic is over. I would love that. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks. Happy holidays. Thank you. Say goodbye to Noah. Okay, I will. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.